Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on location. I'm Juanita Chin, Program Director at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Population Association of America's webinar on demographics of racial violence. This webinar is organized by PAA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee with the help of Bobby Westmoreland as a part of an anti-racism webinar series in which we grapple with important topics such as what does it mean to do anti-racist research and the role of research in an anti-racist praxis in the social science and specifically demography disciplines. With that very brief welcome, I will now introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Bradley Hardy. Dr. Hardy is an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs and chair of the Department of Public Administration and Policy at American University. His research focuses on economic insecurity, intergenerational mobility, and the social safety net. Dr. Hardy. Great, thank you, Juanita. And so uh, <laughs> I want badly for you all to see me. Uh, a little bit of video trouble on my side, but you can, you can hear my voice and we're gonna, we're gonna push on. So I'm um, just really thrilled uh, to have this uh, continuation of the PAA webinar series uh, on the demographics of, of racial violence. Uh, we have a great panel. Uh, all of them warrant longer introductions than I'm able to give. Uh, so uh, with that said, I will introduce the five panelists. Um, first, we have uh, Nicole Jones from the University of Florida. Uh, Nicole is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology uh, and Law at the University of Florida, and her work focuses on race, place, and health. Next, uh, we have Amy Bailey uh, from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Bailey is an associate professor of sociology uh, at UIC. Her research focuses on historic mob violence in the American South, uh, and it examines contexts that foster different kinds of terroristic violence, uh, as well as the characteristics of people who were victimized. Third, we have Trevon Logan. Uh, Trevon Logan is an, a professor of economics at The Ohio State University, uh, where he also serves as associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, his current work is focused on historical health patterns, racial discrimination, and historical racial segregation, political economy, uh, as well as uh, racial disparities across mortality, morbidity, and health in general. Fourth, we have Golin Samari. Golin Samari is a population health demographer and assistant professor at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Her research focuses on social inequalities and health with a particular focus on the inequities uh, that are occurring on the basis of migration, gender, uh, as well as racism and populations in or from the Middle East and North Africa. Finally, Aliasa Sewell is an associate professor of sociology at Emory University. Sewell is trained as a medical sociologist, a social psychologist, and a social science research, research methodologist uh, with a focus on racial inequality, structural racism, health disparities, and social attitudes. Okay, so again, um, I could have given far longer introductions for each one of the great panelists. And so what we're gonna do is go in the order that folks uh, were actually introduced. So right now we're gonna start off with uh, Nicole Jones from the University of Florida. She, along with the other panelists will present for 10 minutes after which we'll open up for uh, Q and A. And I should just say that you will see uh, Tyson Brown, Maume Lu, uh, Bobby Wentmess, Moreland, and Betsy Alifoganis on the uh, on the webinar. They're supporting us. So with that, Nicole, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Bradley. One second. All right, so again, this is Nicole Jones, and my paper is entitled The Hyperracialized Space, Navigating Space 
Racism, and Mental Health in St. Louis County, Missouri. Before I go into this paper, I want to also acknowledge my co-authors on this paper, Dr. Kalia Lewis, who's at the University of Missouri, as well as Alasia Brown, who's also at the University of Missouri. Okay. So the aim of this research is to explore how what we term hyper-racialized spaces or areas embedded with multiple forms of racial violence impact the daily lives of black individuals who reside in St. Louis County. So two research questions guide the study. One, how do black residents perceive and navigate the hyper-racialized space? And two, what are the mental health related implications for black residents living in the hyper-racialized space? Okay. So as I mentioned before, we want to examine how Black Missourians perceive and navigate hyper-racialized space. Uh, note that many spaces fit what we define as hyper-racialized. However, we chose to focus on Missouri counties where certain forms in downtowns as well as Ku Klux Klan activity had or presently occurred. While these forms of racial violence are not mutually exclusive, historically they shape how minorities navigate space. So we collated data from the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center, as well as data from the Equal Justice Initiative and data from James Lowen's online repository of hospital sundown towns. And when we completed that, we are left with four counties. St. Louis is the one that we're focusing on today for this paper, but I also want to acknowledge the other county. Um, let's see. We had a sample criteria where we only selected individuals that self-identify as Black, 18 years or older, as well as residing in St. Louis County. Uh, the whole sample itself represents 42 participants, but for those that are in St. Uh, St. Louis County, it was 20 participants. We conducted semi-structured interviews, and we also had audio recorded phone interviews ranging from 45 minutes to 90 minutes in length. And in terms of data analysis, we conduct a thematic analysis, which is an analytical strategy to provide tools to interpret data and report patterns and themes with detailed description and contextual details. We use thematic analysis to uncover how race and racism embedded in the participants' narratives impact their lived experiences. So with that, we have three emerging themes whiteness and the maintenance of the hyper-racialized space, unspoken rules of police encounters and the embodiment of self-regulation, as well as hyper-vigilance. So the maintenance of a hyper-racialized space theme emerged from participants' responses to a series of interview questions, prompting them to discuss at length various aspects of their community. Overwhelmingly, the narratives were perceptions of how whiteness, through two central path pathways operate as a mechanism to each other and unequally structured their predominantly black environments. Namely, the participants pointed out how they believe the media was used as a tool to perpetuate anti-black racism, which is a sub theme number one, and how they believe the white flight and the fear of predominantly black neighborhoods adversely impacted the resources to their communities, which is sub theme number two. While participants did not explicitly use the term whiteness, their responses to interview questions about aspects of their community openly critiqued the unquestioned anti-Black norms by which their community was judged and unfairly deemed less than compared to their areas. For many participants, whiteness represented cultural and political practices that further marginalized and excluded their communities. Stacy, a 45-year-old lifelong resident was forthright about her assessment how she believed the media perpetuated racist views about Black communities in St. Louis. For Stacy, the media had a direct impact on how she navigated predominantly white St. Louis communities as she admitted, quote, I just think we always have to prove ourselves. I think we always have to prove, no, I'm not coming to the store to steal. No, I'm not coming here to hold you up, end quote. When asked, she, when asked why she thought people hold such perceptions, she states, which is on the screen, what they see on TV, TV tells them that we are dangerous, we are monsters, which makes white people look at people, black people the same, like, oh my God, they're dangerous, they're here they come. But you know, it's just kind of like, what they see on TV becomes the truth, you know? because they, white people, don't know black people, or they don't work with them, or they don't live in the area, so they think everyone's the same for what they see on TV. 
This narrative, this narrative illustrates insidiousness of racist ideologies perpetuated by the news and media, but also underscore how such messages feed into the fear of participants communities, as well as how participants navigate predominantly white neighborhoods, which further aids in the maintenance of a hyper racialized space. The second theme, unspoken rules of police encounters and the embodiment of self-regulation. Participants routinely openly critique how police operate as community gatekeepers within the predominantly Black St. Louis County neighborhoods. How participants talked about the police illustrate how they believe the police operate outside the boundaries of protecting and serving their communities, but more so as a structural force to keep Black individuals within their respective neighborhoods and control their behavior. Perhaps the most prevalent question to emerge within each interview was that for many persons, potential or actual encounters with St. Louis police became an embodied and self-regulatory experience, which resulted in participants policing their own behaviors to mitigate encounters. For instance, the sentiment by Mia, a 45-year-old lifelong resident, was prevalent across many interviews, which is on a screen which states, I'm just very aware, you know, like who I am and who I'm with, I'm driving because I could be pulled over for anything. And if you see me, you know, I look very harmless, like a bookworm, that's not going to matter to the police. If they're just pulling you over for anything. So the one of the things that always hangs in the back of my mind when I'm driving, it causes stress and can become taxing on your system because you don't know, like when you're going to get pulled over by a cop. Many participants like Mia acknowledge that regardless of their appearance, simply being black was a potential reason for getting pulled over by the police that caused them stress. However, within those conversations, respondents highlight the extra steps they took to mitigate any potential encounters. Within her interview, Angela, a 38-year-old lifelong resident, was very transparent about the steps she took to mitigate potential encounters with St. Louis police to protect her safety. Angela states that, but I, I'm always sure that, oh, your car is registered, your plates are right, you don't speed, you follow the rules in the areas so you don't get targeted. Both participants' narratives speak to unwritten rules of driving while Black and how they police themselves to lessen their chances of encountering the police. And the third theme is hypervigilance. How participants talked about their mental health and the cumulative toll of navigating the hyper-racialized space hot on them. Feelings and manifestation of hypervigilance, which was informed by stress and anxiety, permeate through each interview so much so that it seemed as if participants were preparing for racist encounters whenever they left home. For instance, Thomas, 19-year-old out-of-state college student, admitted how he traveled within St. Louis County as a Black man named Phil, which he says, quote, hyper aware of his surroundings on edge and defensive. And I'm always, I'm always on guard and ready to defend myself if I need to. Tiffany, a 25 year old resident provide candid details illustrating how hypervigilance manifests for her, which she says, and it starts, I, it starts the whole dialogue in your head where, um, where, where you're telling the story to yourself like, oh my goodness, are you looking at me? Or you know, I'm going to say the wrong thing? Or how, how I'm going to think of me thinking like that, which when I notice, I, I also notice the sensation, like I feel like there's a pit in my stomach now, you know? I feel when I breathe, it's getting shorter, more shallow. I feel a lump in my throat. I feel those thoughts, you know, like that just close, in, close you in. And I feel the lump in my throat. I feel those thoughts, you know, like they're going to close you in. As evident by these narratives, such intense manifestation of hypervigilance has not only shaped their mental health, but also how they navigated their environment. Okay. So we find that hyper-racialized hyper spaces are geographies that harbor implications for how Black people negotiate space and consequently, their emotional psychological well-being. We find that individuals, as well as institutional practices, individuals being the individual, as well as institutional practices, such as the police, as well as media, maintain the hyper-racialized space, which in turn shape how Black residents navigate space, which can have a toll on their mental health. 
The way its participants negotiate their environment highlights the need for more research investigating the pathways that connect the legacy of racial violence to potential adverse mental health outcomes. And policy efforts should continue to focus on interventions that reduce racial health disparities. So with the study, we have quite a few limitations. One uh, is that we limited these counties to Missouri. Another limitation is underreporting or overreporting of racial violence. Um, so again, we're only looking at data that is suspected or reported forms of racial violence. And also note that whether hyper-racialized space operates as a more robust conduit for poor health outcomes compared to residents in other areas we could not test for, but it's definitely something that we encourage researchers to look into. Our references, and that is all. I just want to extend a thank you to the University of Missouri Extension Specialist for their assistance on this project. And <clears throat> thank you, Nicole. Uh, so this is fascinating work. And I think that one of the things this demonstrates is that this topic um, really uh, spans the contemporary and historical, it's, it's mixed methods. And so you'll see in this panel that you have this mix of uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, research inquiries. And I think that's what makes this uh, really exciting to kind of hear about today. So thank you again, Nicole. Uh, and next we have Amy Bailey from uh, UIC. Amy. Great, thank you so much, Bradley. Let me just get my slides up. Uh, great, fantastic. Uh, so thank you uh, Juanita and Bradley for pulling this together and inviting me to participate. Um, I hope that my words today will provide some insights into an area of historical scholarly investigation at, that will shed light on uh, the intensity of and current, res current responses to the renewed visibility of violence against Black people. Black Lives Matter and the mass resistance movement it has generated are rooted in and responding to the history of violence wielded against BIPOC communities in this country. And it's not possible to unweave the fabric that connects the past to our current experiences. So the names Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and Jacob Blake, among many others, do not represent isolated incidents of violence against Black people. Their names reach back through history and echo those of Harrison and James Gillespie, Fletcher Williams, and Meta Hicks, with along with thousands of others. So I'll take just a moment to provide a snapshot of what we know about historical racist violence in the United States. Uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, it was extraordinarily widespread, although the form and severity of the violence varied across local contexts. And while the specifics may have varied, the campaign of violence was designed to suppress Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color, and its targeted application was linked to white people's attempts to control economic processes and resources. Because of the involvement of law enforcement in many violent episodes, it's not clear what percentage of historical violence could have been prosecuted as criminal, even if the social and political will had existed, which of course we know it didn't. Um, in very few episodes of extra legal violence were the perpetrators ever publicly identified, let alone prosecuted. And as was the case in uh, Emmett Till's murder, the community's sympathies often allowed the attackers to escape unpunished. Even more to the point, we believe that the overwhelming majority of this violence uh, went unreported. So systematic sexual assault against black and brown women, for example, or the violent expulsion of black communities as a means of driving them off their land, were frequently not reported or necessarily considered to be criminal. So through both quantitative analyses and rich case studies, we've amassed quite an extraordinary amount of information about the context that fostered particular forms of racist violence. Lynching, for example, was more likely to take place in communities with heavy economic reliance on cotton, high rates of farm tenancy, uh, political dominance by the segregationist Democratic Party and pluralistic religious marketplaces. Lynching was likely to be threatened but prevented in places where the economy was moving to wage labor and mechanization and the power of the plantation economy was waning. But we're just beginning to learn about the people who were targeted, either as individuals or as a group. So acknowledging uh, the variety of violent tactics the white community employed, uh, I'll focus a bit on the two forms of uh, violence that my scholarship focuses on lynchings that were a lethal form of mob violence 
and threatened lynchings that could have become lethal but didn't. I include this graphic to emphasize how widespread these forms of racial terror were in our nation's history. The excuse solid me, line- Excuse me, yes. Amy, can you show your, share your screen? I'm not sharing my screen? No. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. I thought I had started that. Uh, let's see. Oops. There we go. Okay, awesome. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, this graphic emphasizes uh, how wide these two forms of racial terror were in our nation's history. So the solid line indicates uh, the annual number of lynchings and the dashed line indicates uh, the number of incidents where someone was so credibly and publicly threatened with lynching that it was reported in the newspaper, but the person was not killed by the mob. Uh, the tempo this graphic displays means that a black person was killed by a mob or publicly threatened with lynching about twice a week, every week for 50 years. And this is just uh, in the 10 states that I focus on in my research. Uh, so in terms of thinking about the terrorizing consequences of quote, merely having been threatened, I'd invite you to think about the threat, the effects uh, when schools have been threatened with a mass shooting and gone on lockdown without a shooting actually having taken place. Now, clearly that's the preferred outcome, but the psychological damages are undoubtedly devastating for the entire community. So the work I've been engaged in for the past several years uh, seeks to help us identify the victims of racist mob violence, both uh, lethal and merely threatened. Uh, and let me get rid of the, there we go. Um, uh, so Stu Talne and I, with the hard work of undergraduate research assistants, um, whoops, there we go. Uh, Stu Talne and I, with the hard work of an uh, undergraduate research assistants, searched historic census manuscripts for people who were confirmed lynch victims. And we located about a thousand of them and have compiled uh, qualitative case files for each person that we searched for as well as a data file that's more amenable uh, to quantitative analyses, where we record all the census information and characteristics of each victim and all members of their household. And we found that the characteristics associated with elevated risk of lynching for black and mixed race men varied by local context and did not systematically signal that higher status or lower status people were being targeted. Having characteristics that marked someone as different from other black people in the county increase their risk of victimization, whether those characteristics were associated with being of higher or lower status. And I've replicated this process, again, with the support of a fantastic crew of undergraduate students. We searched for about 2,400 people that our colleague Woody Beck has identified as having been publicly and credibly threatened with lynching, but who were not ultimately killed by the lynch mob. And so far, and I wanna caution that these findings are preliminary, uh, since the data for quantitative analyses only include about half of the data, um, it looks like the characteristics of people who were somehow spared from the lynch mob are uh, much more similar to those of the general population living in their counties than was true of people who were actually killed, uh, which may tell us something important about vulnerability, about who was saved and who was killed. So this graphic uh, presents descriptive information comparing the age distributions of people who were lynched and were quote, merely threatened with lynching in the first four states that we've completed the quantitative data entry for, um, for the targets of threat. And these are Arkansas, Georgia, North Carolina, and Louisiana. Uh, this includes information uh, on 417 lynch victims represented by the black line and 424 targets of threat, which is represented uh, by the solid gray line. And then the dotted lines further divide targets of threat by whether the mob made a serious attempt to take physical custody of the intended victim. And as you may be able to discern, there are two key places where the age distribution appears to diverge for these groups. It looks like there's a higher concentration of potential victims who were able to avoid being lynched among men who were young adults and a somewhat higher concentration of men actually killed among those in their middle-aged years. 
So here in this graphic, uh, we see differences by the intensity of victimization according to marital status and average age, which evidence no significant variation. And a significantly larger share of lynch victims, however, were literate, which is interesting, um, and were also employed as agricultural workers compared to those who were threatened but not killed. And I, I wanna emphasize these are uh, bivariate <laughs> descriptive uh, relationships. So how does this kind of work make a contribution? Um, I think it does so on several levels. In terms of basic research, we can better understand whether victims of racist violence uh, share characteristics with other crime victims. This also has uh, potential practical applications. Ethnic conflict seems to be a durable feature of human existence. And if we better understand vulnerability and victimization, we may be able to gain purchase on identifying likely targets in contemporary situations in order to more effectively tailor our mediation efforts. As an opportunity for engaged scholarship, we can collaborate with social justice organizations to help memorialize victims and to support efforts for truth and reconciliation. We owe it to these people to remember them in all of their humanity and our educational privilege entails our responsibility to use our skills for the betterment of society. Clearly current events demonstrate that the United States desperately needs to face our history of white supremacy and structural racism. And finally, this work has the potential to engage BIPOC and first generation students. Research demonstrates that students who are engaged in learning opportunities outside of the classroom and have stronger relationships with faculty do better in their studies and are more likely to complete their undergraduate degree and also to go on to a graduate program. And projects like these uh, using archival data can be a great match for undergraduate skills and provide a supportive environment where students can grow into their identity as scholars. So there is much more work to be done, and I think it's exciting work. Um, we have a challenge to increase the extent of our knowledge about incidents of different forms of terroristic violence and of the people that it targeted. And massive amounts of archival data are now being digitized and moved online with an opportunity for both data mining and more labor intensive uh, approaches to identify forms of violence that have yet to be systematically cataloged as well as uh, the people who were targeted. We can also expand this work into new geographies and time periods. And finally, we can partner with organizations in our local areas to help document and understand the history of violence and oppression in our own communities and to use work like this to actively engage and support talented students from underrepresented groups. Uh, so thank you so much and I will stop sharing my screen. Terrific, thank you, Amy. And we'll stay with this historical theme and, and move on to a presentation by uh, Trevon Logan from Ohio State University. Trevon? Trevon, make sure you're unmuted. This work is joint with Lisa Cook at Michigan State and John Parman at the College of William and Mary. And we're looking at expanding some work that we've done on segregation and Southern lynching to the entire United States using new data on a national uh, cataloging of lynching. So in the United States, research is concentrated on ethnic homogeneity and public goods. And we know that there's a relationship between trust and economic performance. And we know that levels of trust are lowest in the African-American community. And at a cross-sectional level, we know that areas that and states that had the highest levels of historical racial violence have lower levels of trust today. Um, racial segregation has been thought to be related to racial violence in the United States. Contemporary segregation has been shown to be related and linked to historical racial violence in the form of lynching. And at the same time, lynching takes place primarily uh, as the previous presentation showed in the late 19th century and early 20th century, which is a time of political and economic change for African-Americans. So the relationship between ethnic and racial conflict could be related to the degree of physical separation between groups. And in the United States, that's going to require 
a measure for segregation and analysis of segregation as a mediating factor or correlate of racial violence. And in particular, what we're really asking if we're thinking about the relationship between segregation and racial violence is conditional on the racial distribution of an area. Is it the case that areas that are more segregated have or experience or more likely to experience racial violence? And this becomes uh, ultimately an empirical question. So in this project, what we do is we use a new measure of segregation for the entire United States between the years of 1880 and 1940. And we compare that measure, which looks at the number of households in an area who have opposite race neighbors with expected numbers under complete segregation and under random assignment. And what this measure is able to do is it captures the degree to which residents segregate given a particular racial composition of an area. More important than that, it allows us to measure segregation in rural areas. And that's particularly important to the study of racial violence because a large proportion of racial violence occurs outside of metropolitan spaces. So what we do in this project is we match the segregation measure to new data on American lynchings that has been collected by Dr. Cook. And so we're able to match all lynchings as well as lynchings by race to estimate the relationship between historical black white racial segregation and historical uh, racial violence. In future work, we'll be able to match this to other mention, dimensions of racial segregation and race specific measures of racial violence. And I'll show you some preliminary results later. In addition to segregation, what we can do here is of course, include a number of additional factors to control and estimate whether the relationship is robust. So what are the key findings of this project? We find that racial segregation is strongly correlated with lynchings. So a one standard deviation increase in segregation holding the racial composition of an area constant is related to an additional lynching in a county. Um, the effect holds for black and white lynchings nationally. And that is not the case if we analyze this relationship only in the South. So what this means is that the historical patterns of racial violence, intraracial violence and interracial violence are actually different outside of the South than within it. And this result does not hold for Hispanic, Asian or Native American lynching. And we propose that these are actually placebo tests because what we're measuring is black white racial separation, which may or may not be related to racial violence directed from whites to Asians or Hispanics. So what is this new measure of segregation? This measure of segregation is an intuitive approach to segregation, which builds off of Schelling's model, for example, of households aligned on a street. The advantage of this measure is that it does not require subunits such as census tracts or wards to estimate the relationship. And it relies though on a very data intensive procedure which is the full manuscript census. But it analyzes literally the simplest measure you can think about in terms of residential segregation, which is the race of a household head in the house of their neighbors. So it's going to look at households and whether or not a household is next to a household that is of the same race or an opposite race. And therefore, it's going to exploit the fact that historical census enumeration was a door-to-door -door and face-to-face -face process. So this is an example of the 1880 manuscript census. And what we're looking at are whether or not the households on this um, street are in fact opposite race neighbors or same race neighbors. So we have identified an opposite race neighbor pair on this street in 1880 in Virginia. This is actually the street that our co-author John Parman lives on. So our calculation of this measure is actually straightforward. XB is the actual number of opposite race neighbors in a given area. And then we juxtaposition that to two extremes. Given the racial composition of an area, we can assume the number of opposite race neighbors that would exist under random assignment and under complete segregation. And so the degree to which this measure actually conforms and gets closer to one, it means that the actual assignment of households is close to that one that we would have under complete segregation. And as it gets closer to zero, the actual number that we would expect under random assignment. So this segregation measure captures an element of segregation that is not highly correlated with existing segregation measures, which very importantly require you to divide up geographic areas into these subunits. It's important for the sub study of lynching because we need to know that this is not highly correlated with the percent black in a particular area.
Um, what we do see from this measure, when we think about segregation and the percent black, and I'll go backward and forward with this, this is the 1880 measure for the South where we have the largest concentration of African-Americans in 1880. And we see that there is a difference between looking at the percent black and the level of segregation. More formally, we can see that as the percent black increases, there is a linear relationship with gradually increases segregation. But more importantly for us, this measure of segregation is essentially homoscedastic over the range of percent black in these counties. What that means is that knowing that a county is 50% black, there's a range of segregation that could exist in the counties that are 50% black. Empirically, that helps us then tease out this relationship between segregation and racial composition. Right? So what lynching data do we use? We use the data that comes from Cook, which is the most complete accounting of lynchings in the United States. And it rationalizes the errors in existing lynching data sources and includes lynchings for all racial types, racial groups in the lynching data, Asians, Blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, and whites. And it applies a consistent definition of lynching over time, which has been very difficult to do in this lynching uh, data. And I know something that um, Amy can speak um, much more fully to, which is that you're typically excluding cases for lynchings because there is a technical definition of lynching that I just want to review very quickly. Someone has to be killed. Someone has to be killed illegally, extrajudicially. This cannot be an execution after a conviction. Three or more persons must be involved and the killers have to have claimed to be serving justice or tradition. This is going to exclude murders and racially motivated murders that happen in riots or that happen in mass. Those will not be included as lynchings uh, in this technical definition. So this data set contains over 5,000 lynchings in American history. 62% of all lynching victims are black, 27% are white. We have uh, 286 Hispanic lynchings 80 Native American lynchings and 43 uh, Asian American lynchings. Interestingly, in this data, there is one Canadian lynching and it is an American export. White Americans chased a Native American across the Canadian border and lynched him there. And that is the only Canadian lynching uh, that we can find. So our specification is a very general one where we're looking at the relationship between segregation, controlling for the racial composition of an area and seeing how it's related to the number of lynchings in an area. So we estimate this relationship in a number of different ways. We're using count models, negative binomial and Poisson regressions. And we also estimate probit models and a Tobit model, which is looking at conditional on having a lynching, how many more additional lynchings an area might have as a function of segregation. So when you look at this relationship of the total number of lynchings nationally with segregation, there is a positive relationship with segregation and the number of lynchings nationally in the United States. So the overall relationship is one in which you have greater levels of separation between African-Americans and whites, you are more likely to experience a lynching. If you disaggregate this by race, you'll see a stronger relationship between Black-white segregation and Black lynchings and the relationship between lynchings overall. It is also the case, however, that unlike the Southern results, Black and white separation is actually related to white lynchings as well. So in some future work, what we want to do is incorporate ethnic segregation measures because everything that we did for Blacks and whites can be done for other um, ethnic groups and racial groups as they are encoded in the census. But what you see here is that levels nationally where racial groups are separated leads to more um, intraracial violence as well. What we see in terms of Hispanic lynchings is that there's no relationship at the outset between uh, segregation and the number of Hispanic lynchings nationally. And when we turn to Native American lynchings, we do see a negative relationship. And when we turn to Asian lynchings like Hispanic lynchings, we see no relationship. What we will be able to do in the future is to develop measures of segregation that are Native American measures of segregation, Asian measures of segregation, Hispanic measures of segregation, to see how those vary with the relationship between racial violence and the form of lynching. So we can now see if these results matched information on trust, economic growth, and other measures of social capital. And this project will exploit within counties uh, which has typically been analyzed sort of between counties because we will be able to track these segregation measures for every decennial census over time, along with the number of lynchings that have occurred in particular areas over time as well. Great, 
Well, Trevon, thank you for that. And, you know, we're going to take a shift where we'll talk more in the last two presentations about relatively contemporary issues in, in racial violence. But you can already see from the first three presentations uh, a lot of decisions that have to be made by the demographer with respect to uh, how to characterize uh, these phenomena. So uh, with that, uh, Galeen Samari from Columbia University, please take it away. Sure, I'm um, gonna share, so we're good to go. Um, so like Bradley mentioned, I'm gonna sort of bring us into a contemporary time period. I'm also going to sort of expand the discussion to Islamophobia or, or this concept that I um, discuss about racialization of other groups and how that racialization is associated with um, racial violence. So, um, I, I want to give a little bit of background. So I came to this work in 2015, um, really with the rise of the anti-Muslim rhetoric associated with the Trump campaign at the time. And um, given that I had a background and, and a degree in Islamic studies and demography and public health training, I felt like I was pretty well equipped to speak to Islamophobia as a public health issue because along with that rhetoric, we saw some increases in violence and mortality that I will cover in this talk. So this work really builds on a legacy of structural racism and health scholars. And I think it's important to, to acknowledge the role of them in this work. So Islamophobia is a, is the way that I define it is a social stigma towards Islam and Muslims dislike of Muslims as a political force and a distinct construct referring to xenophobia and racism towards Muslims or those perceived to be Muslim. So it draws upon these concepts that are really sort of studied in different dimensions of social science and demographic research. Um, the piece of it that's particularly interesting is those perceived to be Muslim because, because of racism and a racialization process, we have assumptions about who is or isn't a Muslim in the United States in particular. Um, so just to provide a little overview of Muslims in the US or the demographic information about Muslims in the US. So um, about 60% are immigrants and 42% are US born. By 2050, it's estimated that um, 8.1 million Muslims will be in the US or 2.1% of the US population. Um, and something that's less frequently known is that it's one of the most racially diverse groups in the United States. So about 20% of Muslims identify as black, another 30% are Asian, primarily South Asian, and the largest racial group of Muslims is actually classified as white, many are who are from the Middle East and North Africa. So their lived experience is not often what we categorize when we look at race and ethnicity data. So in my work, I look to a lot of different pathways between in the relationship between Islamophobia and health. So there's individual pathways and some of the things that have been discussed by my colleagues like racism related vigilance that can really um, result in a stress pathway and affect people's health. There's interpersonal pathways and then there's um, structural pathways that I believe really shape these individual and interpersonal pathways. Um, for the talk today, I'm really going to focus on the violence and mortality and some of the structural pieces to tie in with the theme of the demography of racial violence. So part of what plays into mortality and violence is our hate crimes. So a hate crime is a committed criminal offense, which is motivated in whole or in part by the offender's biases against race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. So even if the offender was mistaken in his, in, in his or her perception, the offense is still a bias because the crime was motivated by that bias against a specific group. So it's still categorized as a hate crime. So if we look at the FBI hate crime statistics from 2018, you can, say that, you can see that race is the number one motivator of hate crimes. So 56% of hate crimes are on the basis of race. Um, but the second uh, biggest motivator or bias is religion. So religion is the greatest source of reported bias following race ethnicity. And something like Islamophobia really operates in both of these buckets because somebody who's perpetuating a hate crime against a Muslim is probably making assumptions about that person being a Muslim because not being a Muslim is not necessarily physically identifiable. Sometimes it is. And so there's important questions about 
people being racialized to be Muslim and experiencing hate crimes or people who have physical markers of being Muslim experiencing hate crimes, but it really falls into both the race and, and religion buckets, particularly because of the diversity of the American Muslim community. So I think it's also important to, to point out that if you look at the past sort of 10 years of hate crime data on the basis of religion, actually the number one um, source of religious bias is anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism is observed at the highest frequency but something that people don't realize oftentimes is that the trends are in parallel between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So when you see a spike in anti-Semitic hate crimes, you also see a spike in Islamophobic hate crimes. So what are these types of incidents? So what do these incidents tend to be? So most often they're threats or threatening behavior, but a lot of times these have turned into physical assaults. And so we have over a quarter of the hate crimes reported are physical in nature. Um, and then uh, another 50% are threats or threatening behavior, which are associated with, with again, physical um, assaults and crimes. So if we look at the number of assaults only for, for Muslims from 2000 to 2018, you see a spike in 2001, which we know is um, associated with a backlash following the September 11th, 2001 attacks. Um, but interestingly enough, a lot of people don't realize we also see a huge increase beyond the numbers that we saw in 2001 come after 2015, which is largely attributed to the anti-Muslim rhetoric that became commonplace in the campaigns and the media. So the largest number to date in terms of assaults has been observed in 2017, which is also corroborated by other organizations that gather hate crime information. So. I think it's really important um, to think about, you know, what are the limitations of hate crime data and can we corroborate this data with multiple sources? And so the Council on American Islamic Relations also noted a spike in 2017. So to date, that's the highest on record um, hate crime statistics that we have for Muslim populations. Now, I, I sort of started to mention this, but let me get into it a little bit further. So what are limitations of the, the contemporary hate crime data for those of you who want to do research or, or think about research in this space? So these are based on crimes that are reported to law enforcement agencies. So you have that, um, you have several issues there. So you have underreporting issues. So people may not understand what constitutes a hate crime in their state, may not mention that hate or bias motivated the crime. There's also reluctance of victims to report known offenses to police. There's police trust issues and law enforcement that doesn't recognize or prefers not to acknowledge certain offenses. So the crimes must be identified as bias motivated, um, as bias motivated by law enforcement agencies and reported to the FBI. So then you have the second piece, which is issues in the reporting realm. So states vary because um, in how they report. There are states on record that have like said they had zero hate crimes in the last year. Um, so there's variation in the quality of the data collection procedures as well as the data reporting. Um, and there's different training for law enforcement on hate crime reform, reporting. So overall these sort of um, issues make the data really laden with error and subject to a lot of different biases. Um, this makes it challenging, again, to compare across time or, or location. Um, importantly, I think it's important for demographers to realize that uh, the law enforcement agencies are required at the federal level to report, but it's voluntary for local, state, and tribal law enforcement agencies. So you may have a lot of underreporting, particularly by those groups. Um, and then the training and the tracking really varies. And we know that this is a sensitive issue that requires considerable amount of training and, and there's um, considerable discussion about police reform and this is really one of the dimensions of it. And so it can really bleed into the data that's available for, for analysis. So when you have limitations on the types of uh, hate crime information that are available, then how do you sort of look at the relationship between things like the media rhetoric and, and certain outcomes or you know even individual experiences of Islamophobia and how that bears on people's lives. So I, I think that the field is really moving in this direction of, of looking towards structural measures even further, even as 
those before us have really taught us to look for. Um, so there's, there's some options. So uh, the Haas Institute at UC Berkeley collects the number of anti-Sharia law bills per state that are um, basically uh, introduced and enacted. And so um, the anti-Sharia movement really came to be in 2010 and aims to prohibit Sharia law from being considered or enforced in a state court. But I bring this up because this is sort of a legal structural measure that can be leveraged as an indicator of violence or other um, racist acts at the, at the local level. So there's options like this. There's also media reports. So the, the media reports anti-Muslim violence and crimes really at a different rate than what um, hate crime statistics can show. So it's another opportunity to leverage sort of a state level media report and then use that as a structural measure to look at individual outcomes uh, and behaviors. So with that, I just um, want to say that the media plays sort of a really big role in this and that the media portrayals of minorities project at Middlebury College published a report in 2019 on the portrayal of minority groups in America's mainstream newspapers and found that Muslims were by far the most negatively portrayed. So this racialization of certain groups should not be taken lightly and is really, really a key um, aspect of the racial violence work and the anti-racism work in demography. Thank you. Colleen, thank you for that. And you know, we're gonna we're gonna stay with a relatively contemporary theme uh, from Aliasa Sewell uh, at Emory University. So, uh, Aliasa, please please take it away. Hey, how are y'all doing? Go ahead and try to start my video too. I'm not sure exactly how I look, but we'll go forward in this. Um, so I'm excited to be here. I'm gonna report on uh, the body of research that I've accumulated um, on the, the relationship between policing and health, particularly thinking about this from a contextual experience of an organizational um, structure. Uh, so negative illness feedbacks is actually something that's my understanding of it has my understanding of it has developed over a relation uh, uh, studies of both health effects or health ramifications of living in um, proactive police uh, police environments, as well as a, a more recent study on the relationship between those same factors and um, healthcare utilization. Uh, so it's something I think maybe I'd kind of figured out before, but it's another thing to actually see it um, on, on paper. So uh, generally in public health research, the, there has been an evolution, a, a kind of movement within public health, by the way, to this idea of, of policing brutality. There's something about the actual process of policing that is um, not just a, a, a violent, but it's also to some level, it's, it's, it's extreme, right? It's, it's something that could, should be avoided. And it's something that we, we should not be um, um, a heralding as a nation. We need to think about and, and have different norms about how we solve social problems. So we go back about uh, right now, we're calling about 30 years. This is the 70s, 80s. We saw police as first responders to violence, right? So this would be racial violence. It might be just general violence. Um, and in the case that was talked about before, they don't respond at all to certain types of violence. In the 1990s, the idea of policing or police contact in particular became identified as a type of stressor. And this actually was already um, in the, the kind of sociological literature on life stressors. But we get this, this specific in, um, uh, um, measure of have you had contact with the police, assuming that any type of contact is in fact um, a stressful event that it does endure uh, across the life course. We move into the in the in the, in the 21st century uh, again. This is spearheaded by public health research to thinking about police uh, contact and particularly certain types of contact, proactive policing, broken windows policing, stop pushing and frisk more broadly as as violence in and of themselves. And so, not only um, are police responding to a violence, but they're also creating it. Um, in New York City, uh, which is the the first city uh, to essentially make stop question if it's unconstitutional is also the city that is essentially the, the earmark of this policy um, where a lot of this stuff, uh, uh, the ideas of what we think about police uh, police brutality came into ID, um, um, uh, come, come, came into the public idea. Um, we have this data set that was actually driven by the the, the, the murder of 19, in 1999 of Amadou Diallo. There was a, a, a case that was brought in 2002 and it was one in 2003 that 
one of the things it was that we have to create um, regular public markers of stop, question, and frisk. And so this data that I'm going to pre present to you today is from that database. In New York City, about for every hundred uh, residents, there's about 30 stops by the police. Uh, these are uh, pedestrians, so they're not just of, of residents, but they're people who are essentially using space within a community. About half of those spots and in, in stops involve some type of uh, pat down, and about a, a fifth of those stops in, 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 um, are involved in more aggressive use of force. We, this is the use of a taser, taser, handcuffs, not just putting someone in the handcuffs, but actually using it um, as to, to control the body, um, also pushing someone up against the, fi the fence and so on and so forth. Among these different types of ways in which the police engage the police, the, engage the public, Black and Latino um, uh, residents or pedestrians in these spaces are six times more likely uh, to be stopped. They're 25% more likely to have a pat down and they're 28% more likely to have a use of force. We're going to take these measures. Um, we look at both of these types of measures, but over time, the, the ones uh, over here, the neighbor, just the, the level of, of contact itself has been the ones that, um, that measures out. One way to think about this police violence is that these very measures have in them an embedded structure of, of racism. Um, just because you know, 80 to 90% of the stops in New York City are of Black and Latino people. So we have explicit racism, we have the idea of this disproportionality of racism, and then we have the actual structural system of racism as uh, codified in the stop question and frisk policies that were driven by the conceptions of racial violence um, um, as a city, New York City is something out of control. We have to do with something about it, let's embrace this um, kind of terroristic way of thinking about how police should treat the, the, the city itself. What we know in this in this research is that psychological distress is more likely to occur among individuals who live in neighborhoods where there's more frisking and use of force. Um, the, the, among the statistically associate associations that are there, um, the, the lowest level of, of risk uh, to uh, reporting more psychological distress, this is a, the Kessler six scale, a very, a very well known, very short scale of under, understanding the underlying indicators of clinical diagnoses of, 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 of distress when you don't actually have a DSM measure. The, the lowers is 12%. So that means in, for instance, um, in a neighborhood where there's a 9% in, increase in frisking, that the likelihood of reporting um, a uh, some, some, uh, some array of, of, of feelings that indicate uh, uh, clinical levels of distress um, is 12% is more. Uh, what we can think about that is that difference between 54% and 63%. So you don't have to move very far, but you get these palpable effects. And we see even worse effects, more palpable effects for the neighborhood use of force. In this measure, we find that when you look within these neighborhoods, right, these neighborhoods where it goes from basically 63% or it goes to, to 29 or 30%, uh, men are more likely than their, their, their women neighbors uh, to have uh, clinical distress um, uh, nervousness, effortfulness, and, and worthiness, worthlessness. So you can imagine a boy walking to school, and you have to think about his walk to school, and he may or may or have uh, have in, in contact with the police, or someone he knows who's also a male has had contact with the police. What happens to him when he sees uh, the, the 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 metal detectors? He's nervous. What happens as he's getting out of bed? He's trying to think about his day to work. He feels like he has to apply a lot of effort. And in the, in the end, when he's on the street, he doesn't feel like he's really worthy of anything. And so that contact with the police is essentially uh, reinforces that. We also see, and maybe this is a little less um, apparent in, the, in the, the, the larger kind of literature on criminology, but these same uh, conditions and the most consistent condition here is frisking are linked to uh, increases in underlying conditions. These are the same underlying conditions diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, over, over obese, obesity that are actually linked to COVID. So there should be no relationship to COVID and maybe it's just spurious, but I hate to say that there, even if we're having this conversation at all, right? These vulnerable conditions that are linked to structural inequities and who gets sick and who dies of COVID are also linked to the very possibility of be, those things being linked to the larger policing um, inequitable states. Uh, we also see a relationship with self-rated health being more pair, poor affair. And the reason why that's important is that uh, where self-rated health is, is, in, is linked to early levels of, of earlier levels of, more, of mortality. So the entire life course is shaped by policing and this is not something we can continue to escape. Within these neighborhoods where there's higher levels of, of frisking stop rates, um, uh, we have the, the, the issue here of racial disparities in frisking. That's the 25% the, the, the racial disparities in use of force. That's the, the 
Black and Latino and Asian uh, Pacific Islander residents in those neighborhoods actually experience these, uh, these underlying conditions in different ways. So Blacks and Latinos are more likely to have higher blood pressure in certain types of neighborhoods. It's not the same type of neighborhoods for um, each of these groups, but it is the general pattern is regarding its, uh, its imprint, uh, its butterfly effect on underlying conditions is the same. What's probably more interesting and, and, and surprising is that Asian Pacific Islanders who are most or who are number one have better health outcomes, right? They're, they generally almost every indicator, not all of them, but almost every indicator, particularly when it comes to physical health, they are less likely to be sick and they're also less likely to have contact with the police. However, if they live in a neighborhood where there's greater racial disparities, racial disparities in use of force, they also report, um, it, it basically measures that suggest they're gonna be exposed to high, uh, earlier levels of, of mortality. Another study that I did starts to pull apart this, this idea between this, the idea of, of racial concentration. So the, the, the very idea of stop, question, frisk that became unconstitutional is that black and brown people were being targeted only because they lived in black and brown neighborhoods. So the police may not have been targeting black and brown people, but they, they, they concentrated their efforts in black and brown neighborhoods. So black and brown people were caught in the mix. This is what essentially led for uh, stop, question, frisk to be, be named. Um, unconstitutional at the state level um, in, in New York. In New York, um, what you find here is that in these neighborhoods, the effect of use of force um, on poli on on uh, health problems, this is diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, is stronger in more concentrated areas. So we're um, uh, areas with uh, the racial minority. So we're looking at the right hand of the screen. In the case of obesity, you actually see a crossover effect when there is more than essentially about fifty percent of of the, the residents that are black or brown. You see an opposite relationship when it comes to racial disparities in use and force. So this is essentially going from 28%. It goes, it's not, it's not actually that high. You, you're actually moving uh, to maybe 69% um, more likely among uh, minorities uh, compared to their white counterparts. So this is actually a stronger disparity. On the other hand, it's more likely to, to be linked to health problems in predominantly white neighborhoods. So that, again, this is, these are populations that have better health. They're less likely to have contact with the police, but they also suffer when in fact the, 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 the encounters with the police are inequitable um, across racial groups. Um, and then also within these contextual organizational spaces. I'll, I'll end with the last two studies that both of them actually came out this summertime. They weren't submitted the same time, but that's how unfortunately the world works. Um, we found that there's a, a CVD risk, a specific CVD risk that's linked to living in lethally surveilled areas. So lethally surveilled areas, uh, this is not from fatal encounters. This is actually from what we call legal intervention deaths. This is in the CDC. This is how death records are actually coded. The importance of that is death records are coded as legal intervention deaths by medical examiners and coroners. These are agents of the state, particularly medical examiners. They are also medical uh, officials, right? They're, they're trained in medicine. They're um, given certificates in medication. So this in some sense, it a medical, it's the medicalization, right, of police violence. In those neighborhoods where there's higher levels of lethal of uh, uh, lethality in the 10 years prior to stop questioning frisk, there was at least three or more killings. So this is unfortunately a pretty low bottom, but that low of a bottom um, is linked to higher levels of blood pressure and obesity for all neighborhoods. When we look among women, it's le linked to higher levels of obesity when compared to women who are not in these lethally surveilled neighborhoods. And when we compare women and men, Women in these lethally surveilled neighborhoods, more so than their male counterparts, are more likely to show evidence of the CVD trifecta. These are the, the three major causes of having a heart attack or developing heart disease. This is uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. So I've clearly showed you here that we have this essentially this uh, confluence, right? This, this bellowing up. I, I do think it's a butterfly effect. Um, there's uh, policing inequities that are, have, that are in place. They're, they're not contemporary, they're, they're part of a longer history of injustice and, and targeting and segmentation. Um, these, these develop into health problems, but then when you have a health problem, we should be able to walk that 10 blocks down to the doctor's office and get the services that we need. However, in neighborhoods where there's more frisking, that's not what's happening. This is the measure that I mentioned before is linked to early uh, levels of mortality. This is poor or fair uh, health. In neighborhoods where uh, individuals are more likely to have poor or fair health, uh, we're looking here as we go down, right? All right, so as we go down, they're actually less likely to utilize the emergency room.
So you think about that person at about eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, the doctor's office is closed. They need help. They're having a, uh, some palpitations in the heart. They're having a diabetic shock. Um, they maybe even have an asthma episode. Where do they go? They should be able to go call the emergency room. Unfortunately, they won't for these larger issues of inequities regarding what I would probably call out in one way, the surveillance of the hospital records and clinical records for people who may or may not have been um, 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 uh, involved in a crime. So this is, you know, unfortunately, but fortunately, in some sense, a, a relationship between doctors, particularly in the emergency room and 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 police, um, to identify people who um, number one could have been involved in these this police police encounters, but also um, there there may be um, involved in other types of injurious relationships. I'll end here and maybe this is, you know, would will, you know, irk your, your feelings. But generally I say police is the blood of America. If you have any conversations or feelings about that, that usually tells you about your relationship to either policing, life, or the United States. And I think about this, this conversation between the relationship of the place, segregation. Um, Trevon uh, talked about it before, the, the surveillance system of policing. There's other forms of surveillance systems. We can think about the educational system, we can think about um uh, the, the large issues of who gets into the labor market. And then the, what happens when all of these pressures come in, into, into peace? We have the George Floyd uprising that we see this summer, mobilization. Everything evolves around the impact of these systems on the body. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Aliasa, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. And I think just briefly, it's just interesting to think about how there's these large uh, negative externality effects that, that, are, that are popping up in your work. And I think if you take the whole panel as a whole together, there's just serious implications uh, for, for life uh, here in the United States and, and it, it merits attention uh, from demography. So, you know, with the time we have left, uh, you know, I do want to take the opportunity uh, to ask some kind of maybe thousand foot view questions um, and get reactions here, you know, and I think one um, is, and, and let me pause myself, um, I'll ask a, a question or two, but certainly drop questions in the, the Q&A section and we'll get to some of those as well. Um, so, um, you know, I guess big picture, you know, do, do the panelists view their sort of being barriers to research on racial violence within the demography field? And I guess kind of a corollary to that is whether and to what degree research on racial violence has or has not been marginalized. Now, I appreciate that that might vary depending on uh, the discipline that you also inhabit in addition to demography. So, you know, we have a mix of, say, for example, uh, you know, health scholars, sociologists, economists, maybe that varies, uh, but, but certainly wonder about that. And I guess I wonder with that said, you know, is there a moment to we kind of reconsider uh, where this, this research fits, where racial violence research fits? So um, feel free to jump in, raise your hands, I feel like I'm back to being a teacher again. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start off. Uh, sure. so I'm a sociologist. Uh, I typically present at ASA, uh, PAA, and the Social Science History Association. Um, and I will say that I've found all three of those organizations to be really welcoming of this research. Uh, the problem has been trying to get a critical mass of scholars that you can put together a panel that this makes sense within. So like at PAA, frequently we wind up, um, we wind up presenting in the posters, which is, which is fine and great. And we get a lot of foot traffic um, with the posters, but, but trying to find another, you know, three or four papers that this fits really well with, I, th I think that's the challenge, frankly. No, that's fair. Any other folks want to chime in? Uh, I have a bunch of questions here. So, uh, yep, Delene. I'll just chime in to say that I think that as the discussion has been extended to like this discussion of who is experiencing violence and racialization and bringing in sort of the structural racism and health scholars with the sociology of race ethnicity scholars and sort of like tying all that work together, it's harder to find sort of an institutional home or like an appropriate panel as you sort of dive deeper into the nuances of it. I would also like to see, you know, more on policing and police violence specifically at um, entities like PAA, but 
I think that there, just by having this panel, there's been a demonstration of sort of openness to this discussion and really expanding the demographic research on racial violence. So those are kind of the ways that I would like to see it go. Well, that's helpful. I mean, I guess I would just add that, you know, oftentimes there's a tendency, perhaps even, you know, well intentioned to put things in bins and boxes. And, you know, for example, one thing that you take away from this discussion is that, you know, racial violence is a, is a health policy uh, topic and it has all sorts of huge potential negative implications. And so, um, you know, that kind of leads to another question, which is, you know, we, we want to kind of organize research areas oftentimes. And, you know, and again, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. I could be wrong about that, uh, but I don't think so. Uh, but I wonder, uh, right now, there's much discussion about situating research within an anti-racist uh, frame. And, and I guess I just wonder the degree to which we think studying racial violence it, it does fit uh, within that. Is, is racial violence research uh, anti-racist research? Is it parallel? Um, and, and maybe there's another way of thinking about this altogether that I, that I haven't considered. Any reactions there? I mean, we hope it would be. Um, unfortunately, um, a recent memo from our uh, executive leader suggests that any type of conversation about anti-racial violence, about white privilege is actually uh, not gonna garner you federal funding. So you think about that in relationship to NSF, NIH, um, uh, where do you get this work funded, right? I would love to tell you that there is a national database of, of legal intervention depth. There isn't, right? There's not a national database, a mandatory national uh, surveillance depth of a, a database of police killings. So if we wanted to get one, where does the money come from? Right. And these are federal, these are federal numbers. Um, so we're we're in a, a bind here. Yes, it should be. Unfortunately, the, the climate, particularly right now, for it uh, to be there is uh, is is not uh, very friendly. No, that's that's helpful. I'm, 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 oh yeah, I'm, uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole first, and yeah. then Colleen. Okay, I would add is that research that engages with policies as well as structures and organizations and institutions, you know, that would be considered anti-racist research. Um, I think what we've all discussed talking about the policy implications right now would then inherently be anti-racist research. So for me, I just think if it talks about the policies and structures as well as practices, um, it's engaging in that type of research. Oh, that's helpful. Going. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Dr. Jones. Um, I think it's also like a lot of demographers tend to be quantitative in nature, and it's really useful to think about um, sort of quantified critical race theory as a lens for thinking about how to be an anti-racist researcher. So um, part of that theory is arguing that you know, the centrality of racism is really complex and deeply rooted in aspects of society that's not readily amenable to quantification, for example. So even if you're taking numbers or looking at, you know, hate crime information like I am, I have to also be aware that, you know, that's not inherently anti-racist. It's actually realizing that the system is much bigger than that and then taking it to an actionable and policy place. Very helpful, very helpful. Any other reactions to that, that question? Okay, we've got a bunch here too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, you know, a, a broad question and this one uh, comes from the, the audience about, um, you know, measurement and, you know, we're a diverse uh, intellectual community. And so I think this is one of the strengths of the panel um, that, that in fact, there's not gonna be any um, one specific way that you get at such a, a difficult and quite frankly, painful um, phenomena, right? So, you know, I guess one question is, um, you know, do you all as, as a panel kind of take an expansive view uh, of measurement within this domain? And I'm thinking about um, some of the, the researchers and potential grad students who might be thinking about sort of engaging this work. So I'll try to answer that uh, briefly. I think um, in this area, you really have to be expansive for a number of different reasons. 
um, the data is not administrative, first of all, which is typically something particularly social scientists and certainly demographers tend to like uh, to use. And second, the way the relationships that you might want to estimate might require you to think about things in a very different way. And I think typically going from experiential knowledge to measurement is the way that this particular area advances, which is very different than moving from administrative data or highbrow abstract theory to thinking about measurement. And so you'll see, I tend to see that the measures here are richer, they're more creative and they're novel because they come from something that is experientially different, which again speaks to the need to have a diverse group of researchers who are bringing those experiences which have been excluded from the academy to academic research to answer these questions. Yeah. Oh, that's great, that's great. And actually sort of thematically um, kind of within the same domain, you know, there is a question uh, for early career scholars, you know, um, for folks who wanna start off and begin doing this research, um, because frankly, you know, uh, I'm doing uh, some of this, uh, collaborating with uh, Trevon right now. Uh, my work is sort of in the social safety net, but I'm seeing where there's linkages to this variation that we see contemporarily, and that there's a really important uh, historical component that has linkages to racial violence uh, and exclusion more generally. But if you're kind of early career, um, you know, one question is, do, do you all have any uh, particular books or articles that you consider to be necessary reading? Uh, do you think there's coursework that would be a nice sort of landing spot to kind of engage with this work? Any tips for, for those early career folks, maybe at that, uh, maybe grad student level, advanced undergrad, maybe even an assistant professor who sees where they might wanna transition? Yep, Amy? Yeah, I would say uh, one of the things that's been most uh, useful for me and is in fact reflected here in the um, in the panel is to read outside of your disciplinary boundaries, right? Um, you know, I think some of the most insightful uh, work that I've uh, that I've encountered, right, has been right uh, Trevon and Lisa's uh, great work. Uh, in economics, right, has been a ton of work that's been put together by historians that really sort of helps me uh, think about the, um, the historical uh, grounding and implications and, and gives me better, uh, not that demographers struggle for theory, but, uh, but gives me more of a, more of a theoretical uh, embeddedness, right? Oh, that's helpful. You know, I would, I would say my entire, uh, the at least the research you see me doing now is an experiment into criminology. I'm not a criminologist. I wasn't trained as a criminologist. But however, um, I was deeply affected uh, by a, a range of, of killings, starting with um, Trayvon Martin, went to University of Florida, partied a lot in Orlando. That hit home, seeing Eric Garner on the New York, the cities of, uh, of, of the streets of New York uh, being, you know, choked to death. I have asthma. I, you know, went to Brooklyn and often as a, as a kid that hit home. I think the, the, the basic point is sometimes you have to actually uh, privilege your own ideas, your own subjective knowledge. People call it subjective. It's not subjective. You see things and it tells you what is real. How do you know what to look for when you look at a, at a literature? You have to know, you have to have some reference point to start the inquiry. Um, so when I started looking at the, the data when it comes to policing, I had an understanding of, of residential segregation already because that's what that's the kind of work I, I was doing. I had an understanding of, of institutional gatekeepers. I didn't have any understanding uh, about criminology besides the fact that I knew from my research on mortgage, mortgage markers that it's about the entry into a, a system. Incarceration, love it, but it's too late in the, in the process. We need to understand that first point of contact where people start to get criminalized. No, I mean, I think I would just echo that, you know, part of why I think we collectively got into this probably, and, and I don't know everyone on the panel, but it's about being passionate about a topical area. You think it matters and that's motivational. And I think that if we can try to promote spaces where there's other folks who are working on similar topics, I think that that validation can go a long way uh, because ultimately the, 
the scholar does have an instinct that this matters. It sure as heck is helpful though, when you have other people out there saying, no, you know, you're onto something. This, this is interesting, you should push this. And oftentimes that's not the case. You know, oftentimes it's just like, well, no, I think, I think I've got something here that matters. It certainly motivates me. I think this is important. People need to know more about it. Uh, so no, th this helpful commentary and, and helpful reactions here. Um, so, you, you know, some questions kind of coming in here um, and, and one is uh, targeted uh, towards uh, Goline, but, but I'd like for others to chime in as well. And really it's kind of a, a question about, uh, you know, data sources. Um, just the degree to which there might be uh, disaggregated, uh, you know, kind of uh, crime or, you know, event data um, that basically tracks uh, events occurring among Afro-American, uh, Asian, or other ethnic groups who might have arrived um, maybe 30 years ago, right, uh, or versus maybe newly arrived immigrants. You know, do we have ways of trying to trace out or disaggregate differences and and these events that occur, um, curious. Sure, so I, I tried to answer this in the chat a little bit, but um, yes, it's complicated, but yeah, it, it'll involve some data lifting on your part to link data sources, right? Some more historic sources with contemporary hate crime information. And then another thing to be mindful of is that the way that we've collected this data has changed over time, just as the way that we define racial ethnic categories evolves and changes, then the bias attributed to certain race ethnicities has also evolved and changed and thus the hate crime data is variable across time. So I think as long as you're mindful of, of those things, you can link some data sources. And then I really, to, to echo like reflecting our subjective experience in the work, like, um, my subjective experience in the world is not captured in any sort of data. And that is my motivation for looking at things the way that I do. And so I encourage everybody to really try to um, take that approach based on what, what they're seeing. And, and some of that is being really creative in the data sources that you link and connect in order to answer the questions that you're interested in. And then collecting you know, qualitative information to further support that. Do I think there are generational differences and immigrant communities experiences of crime? Absolutely. Do we know that there's um, spillover effects when there's huge spikes in, in hate against one community? Absolutely. When anti-black hate rises in this country, so does anti-Semitism and so does Islamophobia. So <clears throat> I think also thinking about how these things are interconnected and then reflecting that in our work is, is something powerful that we can do. Now that's that's really helpful, and and so you know it's interesting. You know, time flies here. Um, you know, just five minutes left, left, four minutes left. There there was a question uh, that did come about uh, for Nicole Jones, and I think the idea and spirit of this question was to really learn more about some of the motivation, be it theory or policies, that kind of drew you to the St. Louis question to kind of operationalize the effects within these St. Louis area neighborhoods and. Um, you know, it's interesting when you're in front of people. Um, I, I've been told of, you might tell me, there, there's, the, there's a street that's prominent in, in St. Louis that, that really separates uh, economically. Uh, so I know that a lot of folks have looked into St. Louis as an interesting mm -hmm. case. Yeah, so I was previously employed at the University of Missouri. So that was also a tie to look into Missouri counties. But going back to the other panelists' points is like these subjective experiences that basically kind of uh, weigh down the reasons as to why I'm, I'm doing the type of work that I'm doing. Uh, my co-author, Dr. Lewis, also had similar experiences where we've been in spaces where we felt uncomfortable or unwelcome. And so, you know, kind of talking through that um, essentially establish why we want to do the type of work we, we did, as well as the contemporary implications in St. Louis, uh, such as Mike Brown's shooting, right? Um, so we wanted to see as to whether there's not only historical elements that speak to contemporary outcomes uh, in terms of racial violence, so that motivated our research for sure. No, that's, it's, it's helpful. And I think that kind of dovetails into 
what perhaps is going to be our final question, and, and it's sort of a comment that there's a responsibility issue here. We're talking about difficult topics. Uh, this is violence. These are deaths, murders. Um, you know, these are hangings. And so, um, how do folks manage the imagery? How do you manage um, how far you go to make the point uh, as as teachers, as professors? You know, Amy. Yeah, if I could, that is always, and particularly, right, because I'm a white scholar and my uh, advisor and one of my primary uh, collaborators, right, is also a white scholar. So, um, you know, so we we deal with that. And then I think we deal with that in a um, multiplicative <laughs> uh, way, right? But but one of the things that, that we've done that I think has been, um, has been really effective in terms of working with our students uh, is we actually uh, have organized a memorial reading of the names of lynch victims. And we've got on the website, we've got all sorts of uh, resources for people to do that, but as a way to really, um, you know, humanize the individuals, uh, help our students understand the magnitude of the catastrophe, but not necessarily have to dishonor the memories of, um, of people whose, whose lives, right, we're trying to memorialize rather than the really unfortunate circumstances of their deaths, so. No, no, that's helpful. Yeah, uh, to follow up on what Amy uh, mentioned, I, I've never directly involved students um, with uh, lynching data itself, the micro data individual um, lynchings. I'm very sensitive uh, to that. My great uncle was the victim of a lynching. And so that would be something you could unintendedly really get into a very dangerous area with that. And I do think it has to be handled um, with a lot of care. Just thinking that it's historical is not necessarily going to be enough to do it. But there are many other aspects that you can involve uh, students with the actual data analysis of the regression with large sets is not as, um, well, regressions have their own emotional problems for students, but they are not, <laughs> they're not the same as the issues that might come up um, uh, with lynching. So there are other ways to involve them with the, with the process. And you also want to make sure that um, students are seeing this as a social process. Um, in addition to thinking about the individual cases um, and, and the point about the frequency of lynching, I think is actually a very important point to make when you're um, and, and not selling these as individual events that are sort of isolated and idiosyncratic. This is part of a really a social process and, and a root of systemic um, violence and routinized violence and sort of socialized violence. And that's an important aspect to sort of bring uh, to students, particularly in the classroom, not just separating it from research, but also to teach students about this more, more broadly. Any other comments on this from the panelists? No, I'll, I'll mention something on this. I, I do think the, the work is very heavy and I think you have to make a disclaimer. It's particularly when you start talking about uh, the criminal legal system and the broader uh, issues here. We're talking, unfortunately, about coffins. We're talking about that right now. We have two social epidemics, I would say, in one in the same place. There is all of them are about coffins. What I would what I would offer though is uh, at least the organizational space. Exactly what Trevon Tre is saying that this organizational approach really really works. If we think about these things as individual cases, we 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 lose focus that of what the system actually does. The system is designed to reproduce itself. It's not designed uh, to take one person and put them in a coffin. It's designed to reproduce itself at the population level and an organizational um, uh, context, the neighborhood effects research is one way of thinking about it. Most of criminology criminology takes such a, a approach, although they not they don't always take a, a multi-level approach, but considering this as an organizational space and thinking about the boundedness, right, of the institutions around that space gives you an understanding of social relationships. Right. And yes, in every social relationship process, there is a, a person on both ends of that. However, I think always considering the fact that we're in an organizational structure designed to re reproduce violence um, uh, uh, from on both parts to take take us out as well as uh, to, to create the process of of, of of this proliferation of violence on both ends of this. Well, I think we should we should end there because um, that's that's said wonderfully. And I think that to be blunt, I think that PAA is at least one 
uh, of the appropriate homes for scholarship on, on racial violence. And um, there's more important work to do. So I just wanna thank the panelists uh, for, for their participation. Uh, this was a very fruitful discussion. I encourage the attendees to follow these folks in their scholarship as it continues to progress. Um, you know, thank you absolutely uh, to folks with PAA and the DEI committee uh, for their support, uh, including Juanita Chen, Tyson Brown, Maume Lu, uh, Hedy Lee, uh, as well as Betsy and Bobby with PAA. So thank you all and uh, have a great and uh, safe rest of your week. Take care.